Another form of model that's important um, is a block diagram. And oftentimes a transfer function like this can be represented as a block diagram as shown. Here, G of S is our system and it's represented as a block. And U of S and Y of S are signals where U of S is the input to our system and Y of S is the output of our system. So for example, G of S could be a drive line where the input is the torque applied to the one end of the drive line and Y of S is the angular twist in the drive line. Mathematically, the output is equal to the transfer function times the input. And you can see that sort of here. We can just divide or multiply U of S on both sides to the left hand side. And so mathematically, this is very simple. It's a very simple way to calculate the output signal. It's the transfer function multiplied by the input signal. If we were in the time domain, we would need to use the convolution integral, which is, which is much more difficult than just simple multiplication. The advantage of this becomes especially apparent when we start to combine systems. So let's say, for example, we have two systems in series. So for example, G of S could represent some power electronics, and H of S could represent an electric motor, or G of S could represent an IC engine, and H of S could represent the drive line, whatever. Recognizing that the output of H of S is going to be the input multiplying the transfer function, we can see that the output signal just has that form, where we already knew that Y of S had that form. And so if we wanted to know what the sort of combined dynamics of these two systems in series were, an IC engine in series with a drive line, where U of S is the input on the, to, the, to both systems in series, and this is the output of both systems in series, we can see that we basically just multiply the two transfer functions. And so this begins to give us some, some understanding of how nicely the transfer function is for combining complicated systems. You know, multiplying two transfer functions is much simpler than, than performing a bunch of convolution integrals. We've seen block diagrams previously when we first introduced the structure of a control system. And here you can see again, um, it's useful for visualizing very complex systems, lots of components put together with lots of inputs and outputs to the system. In a situation like this, each of those blocks, each of those systems can be represented as a different, as a transfer function. And each of the arrows represents signal flow. And we can start to get a sense of how, how nicely we can combine these individual subsystems into one large system model. If these were all differential equations, it would be much more challenging. A couple of other elements of a block diagram that I'll take a second to, to explain is one, the summing junctions. So for example, this summing junction um, the signal coming in on the positive sign is our reference R, and the signal coming in uh, on the negative sign is our measured output Y sub M. And so E sub M is then the positive signal subtracting the signal coming in on the negative sign. So that's what this summing junction represents. Also, we have this branching point and anywhere that a line is branched off, the signal is unchanged. So um, the output of the whole block diagram is Y, and where we branch it off, this signal is also Y. We will come back to block diagrams later in the semester. We will now introduce the concept of time response. And so by time response, I mean when we have a model of a physical system, we in essence want to determine the response of its output as a function of time. When we had differential equation models, we were able to do this basically just by solving the differential equation. We can also do this with transfer function models. So consider the transfer function of our drive line from earlier, where we had an input of torque and an output of
angular twist. In general, we may want to determine you know, the twist experienced by a driveline for different types of torque inputs. For example, if there's a big sudden application of torque, a step in torque, or if the torque is being oscillated at some frequency. And so the way that we find that theta of t is first to find theta of s. And we can find theta of s where the output is just the transfer function multiplying the input. And then we take the inverse Laplace transform of theta of s to get the time, the corresponding time function theta of t. So let's go ahead and do that for a couple of standard inputs. First, let's consider an, an impulse input. So we're finding the impulse response of the drive line. So you could consider this to be a, a very rapid sort of uh, spike on the torque, um, where it's a large torque for a short duration of time. Theta of s, the output signal again, is the transfer function times the input signal. Um, g of s is defined on the previous slide, 1 over js squared plus bs plus k. T of s is the Laplace transform of the unit impulse. If we look back at our Laplace transform table, the Laplace transform of a unit impulse is just equal to 1. So we substitute in our expression for t of s and g of s. And that gives us the expression for theta of s. I'm going to go ahead and substitute some numbers for j, b, and k um, in order to make things a little bit easier. So let's assume that our, that our expression for theta of s has that form. If we looked at the poles of this transfer function, the roots of the denominator, we would find that they're complex. Uh, so we would expect that our time function, when we take the inverse Laplace transform, would be a decaying sinusoid. The real part of the poles tells us the rate of decay or growth. The imaginary part of the pole tells us the frequency of oscillation. And so again, we've, we've dealt with this a little bit before. We've seen some similar examples. And so we would expect um, something like this form, where we perform uh, where we complete the square. So we take the 6 and divide by 2 to get 3. If we expanded this, we would get s squared plus 6s plus 9. So we have the term matching the s squared. We have the term matching the 6s. But we don't want 9. We want 25. And so in order to get 25, we need to add 16 more, which is 4 squared. Looking at this, um, you may remember that it has a similar form to a sine, a sine, where a sine is omega over s squared plus omega squared. But the shift in the Laplace domain corresponds to multiplication by an exponential in the time domain. But in order to get the form that we want, we need this coefficient to match this coefficient. So in order to get a 4 in the numerator, we need to factor out a 25. Then if we do that, we can recognize this from our Laplace transform pairs table and our Laplace transform properties tables. The 25 comes out front. The shift by 3 corresponds to e to the minus 3t. And the remainder is sine of 4t, because 4 corresponds to the omega. So what this tells us is, if there's a an impulsive torque applied to the drive line, we would expect it to ring. Um, the, the angular twist in the drive line would uh, would oscillate with with decaying amplitude. Now let's look at how the drive line would respond to a different type of torque input. In this case, a step in torque, so a very rapid application of torque that's held. Again, the output signal is equal to the transfer function times the input signal. Looking back at our Laplace transform table, the Laplace transform of a unit step is equal to 1 over s. So we take the Laplace transform of the unit step. We get 1 over s. We plug in for g of s and t of s to get this form. If we looked in our table, we wouldn't find an expression that looks like this. 
but what we can do is we can perform a partial fraction expansion you know, like we did earlier with MATLAB. We get numerators as shown here again. So the second term is easily recognized as a, as a step being multiplied by 4. Here we have this denominator that's uh, representative of a sinusoid, either a sine wave or a cosine wave. For a sine, we would like to have a numerator of omega, which is 4. For a cosine, we would like to have a numerator of s, where the s has been shifted by 3. So we're going to end up with something like this, where the first, time, first term is a decaying cosine, the second term is a decaying sine, and the last term is a step. In order to get the correct coefficients here, um, we need a coefficient of minus 4 in terms of s. So if we choose a to be minus 4, that gives us the right coefficient. Um, distributing that negative 4 will give us a minus 12. We don't want a negative 12. We want a negative 24. So in order to, to get a negative 24, we need this to be negative 12. 4 multiplying negative 3 gives us negative 12 and that expansion is equal to the original function. We again can take the inverse Laplace transform. The negative 4 comes out front. This is a cosine with frequency 4 and a exponential decay of minus 3 shown there. Here we have a sine with a frequency of 4 and also a decaying exponential of e to the minus 3t, constant of minus 3 out front. This is 4 times a unit step, which we could represent as 4 times the function 1 of t. But since we make the presumption that our function doesn't start until time greater than or equal to 0, we can also just represent it as a constant 4. And so that time function shows the response of the drive line. Therefore, if we applied a, a large step in torque to one end of the drive line, we would expect the twist in the drive line to, to oscillate with decaying amplitude, but also um, reach a steady state value that's non-zero. So, which physically makes sense, that torque applied on the one end will cause the drive line to twist, and it, it won't return to its original undeformed um, shape. So as t goes to infinity, this will die out to zero, and we'll be left with some, some twist. We will now go and return back to MATLAB and show a couple of MATLAB commands for determining time response of a system. So here's MATLAB again. We still have all of the commands from previously. I'm going to go ahead and clear all of that text to make things cleaner. We still have the Laplace variable s defined. I will go ahead and define our transfer, fun transfer function g, which was 100 divided by s squared plus 6 times s plus 25. To find the impulse response, we can use the impulse command. So we uh, use the command impulse and, f and supply it a transfer function g. And it'll generate a graph of the corresponding output for that, for a, an input that's a unit impulse. So that's what it looks like. Um, which is what we would expect. It's a decaying sinusoid that decays to zero as time goes to infinity. Similarly, we can find the step response of our transfer function by using the step command. For this, we, would, we saw that the output should be a decaying sinusoid with an offset of 4 um, added to it. That's exactly what we found.
returning back to the PowerPoint presentation. That concludes Module 5. In summary, we learned what a partial fraction expansion was. Um, it's a means to expand a rational function into, into individual terms such that we can recognize the Laplace transformed function in our set of tables. In general, there are three different cases. Um, when we have real distinct roots, when we have repeated roots, and when we have complex roots and we don't factor the quadratic. We can perform this partial fraction expansion by hand or with MATLAB. In this, in this module, we use MATLAB. In the future, we will learn how to do this by hand for simple cases. We learned an alternative mathematical representation of physical systems uh, called the transfer function. The transfer function is the Laplace domain. It represents the input-output behavior of a system. It has pros and cons compared to a differential equation representation. For example, it's very, it makes it very easy to combine different models, different subsystems. It's, uh, it's a completely algebraic model, which is nice. Disadvantages are that it doesn't capture the initial conditions of the system and that it could only be applied to linear time invariant models. We also introduced block diagrams as a graphical representation of complex systems. And we introduced the concept of finding a time response of a system, i.e. finding the output of a system as a function of time when given a transfer function model and the input to the system.